Happy day. We're going into phase two next Sunday. Yep, I'm sorry, there'll be no more bathrobe worshiping. It'll be, it'll be your finest and we'll be here uh, still practicing, you know, what we need to do to stay safe. There'll be nursery and children's church, so bring them and we'll take care of them. Um, next, this, next week, too, we're going into a uh, time of call to prayer. There will be fasting and praying this week. If you don't know uh, how to do that, uh, you can talk to me or talk to Byron. He'll give you some suggestions. And next Sunday, we'll have a call to prayer here. Um, it's also Father's Day, so just in case you forgot. Uh, if you are a visitor this morning, there's a thing in the little card in the pew ahead of you. Please take it out, fill it out. And we're not live yet, are we? No. Okay. Uh, we do have an introduction this morning. His name is David, and he is a new member of our family. That is so good. That is so cool. So this will be a good time. Why don't we stand up, stretch our legs, and we can turn around and just do a nice wave to all of our friends. And there we go. That's good. And today, because it's a special day, we are going to join together and say the Pledge of Allegiance as we go into our, our worship time, the Flag Day. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Amen.
standing please and turn your Bibles to the book of Colossians Colossians chapter 1 we're going to be beginning in chapter 1 verse 15 chapter 1 verse 15 Colossians he is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of all creation for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth visible and invisible whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Would you pray with me, please? Lord, thank you for this truth. Thank you for who you are and what you do. Lord, we come before you with a lot of needs, a lot of concerns, a lot of burdens. And as we consider your power and your authority and your preeminence, you're the one person that we can come to. And thank you that you're more than enough. 
In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So there's lots of stuff going on in the world. There's lots of turmoil. There's lots of chaos. Hard to put that aside. But this morning, when the music fades and when it's all stripped away, we simply come and we want to bless God with our song. So sing with us this morning. Worship God, your creator, your maker, sustainer of it all. He's not surprised by anything. And he longs to hear your worship. When the music fades and all is stripped away, and I simply come, longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart. song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship and it's all all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. The King of endless words. No one could express how much you deserve. Though we can't walk, all I have is yours. Every single breath, I'll bring you more than a song for a song in itself. It's not what you have required. You search much deeper within through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. All about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. It's all about you. Sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. It's all about you, Jesus.
Holy, holy, holy is the lamb, the lamb that was slain for me, the lamb that was slain for sinners throughout eternity. Father God, bless Byron as he brings us a word from you this morning. Open our ears and our hearts that we may hear your voice. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I don't know if you realize it or not, but we're having a little bit of technical difficulties this morning. And one of the things, I can tell you right now, if you leave the clock up there, I won't get anything done. I promise you that. Please take the clock down. <laughs> now, if I understand, if I understand right, um, we're not online. We're not doing anything broadcasting. We're online? Yep. Yeah, just now? Yeah, just the camera. Okay, just the camera. What else is? The, uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, you mean no PowerPoint? You pardon me while I have a conversation with the people in the back <laughs> of the room. I'm so sorry. I, um, yeah, so we don't get PowerPoint, so we're spoiled and when we don't see that, so you, you might have to listen a little harder. Um, one of the things, and I realize even as I say it, you don't care, and that's okay, but when I was growing up, when I was a teenager in high school, I was in the crow's nest doing what they're doing, and there were gremlins in the sound system all the time. And if there was any correlation with the movement of God and the mess-ups in the technology, um, then it always happened because I, I, this is maybe a good thing in a perverted kind of way. Maybe you have to listen in a different way than you would normally. But uh, a lot of distractions. But the main thing is I was concerned about our church family in the homes, but right now you're saying they can hear us or, and, and see me. Wow, double blessing. All right, very good. Um, what I want to do is we didn't get a chance to really dive into this before we, we get into Colossians. I want to talk about next Sunday. It is our, we're phasing into phase two. We're not totally back into normal like we have been before. And what we're doing now, if you're visiting with us, this is not normal either. This is, we're, we're adjusting, we're going through the process. But next Sunday, we will start with children's church and we've got youth activities that are gonna start. We've got nursery that's gonna start and, and different things, but we'll still have the physical distancing. We'll still have folks um, spread out. But one of the things that I wanna just really emphasize because I don't want you to come Sunday morning um, and not be prepared for this, is we are not doing the Saturday night services any longer for the time being. The Lord may lead directly down the road, but right now we're stopping the, the Saturday night and we're just doing Sunday morning. So we'll all be here that are able to come on Sunday morning. And I mentioned last night, and I'll mention it again this morning, we have some real servant-hearted people in our congregation that have gone the extra mile uh, doubling up on music, on cleaning, on wiping down the pews, doing all the things to get us so that we could get to this point. And I am so very, as a matter of fact, would you give them a round of applause uh, this morning? I'm amazed. I'm amazed at how much uh, extra work and not a, not a gripe among them. And I'm, I'm so grateful for that. I'm grateful for the servant attitude and the heart uh, to be able to do all that they've been doing. But next Sunday morning, we're going to have a, a call to prayer. 
And if you're not familiar with that, what, what it is, it's, it's coming in the, in the presence of God as a body of believers, and it's got a number of elements to it, but the primary thing is praise, thanksgiving for getting us to this point, and intercession for where we go from here, both as a church as well as a country. And I really believe not just in the power of prayer, but the power of corporate prayer and part of what we're doing and we want you to do. I think Father's Day is the perfect time to do it as we come before our Heavenly Father is we'd like you to be prepared when you come in. If the first thing you first time you think about Jesus is when you get out of the car and walk into the church building on a Sunday morning, you're not really prepared to worship. And the same is true when you come into a time of prayer. If you wait until Sunday morning on the drive here, you really haven't prepared your heart to come into his presence. If the only meal you get spiritually is on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights, you're going to starve to death. You've got to, have, you've got to have that relationship. And part of that is fasting. Part of that is prayer. Part of that is getting your heart uh, connected with your Lord. And there are so many elements to that. But just real quick, uh, fasting is uh, the biblical response to seeking God's face with passion. It is uh, Moses did it, Jesus did it, Daniel did it. And because of that, because of that example, what you do is you don't just abstain. And please hear me on this. And that's okay, the clock's down, I'm okay. Uh, please hear me on this. Uh, it isn't just abstaining. Fasting is feasting. And what I mean by that is you take away one thing and you put something much, much better in its place. You feast on your dependence upon God. Now, in my history, as I've, I've experienced past, uh, fasting and spiritual disciplines, one of the things that has struck me more than once over the years is how incredibly proud and arrogant and blinded I am. And if you think you're real spiritual and you're going to start fasting, if you do it right, you'll realize before you're done, you ain't near as good as you thought you were, and you need him a lot more than you thought you did. And that's okay, because that's part of it, is coming into his presence and fasting. Okay, well, y'all have a good day. It's good to be with you this morning. Wait a minute, wait a minute. We need to preach. Um, let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer as we jump, jump into Colossians chapter 1. Would you pray with me, please? Lord, thank you for things not always being normal. Thank you for the way that you, you move. Thank you for the way that you work. Lord, I pray that you would capture our hearts and our minds this morning. May we not leave this time of corporate worship the same as we came. Overwhelm us with you for your glory, for your kingdom. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Homer wrote the Odyssey thousands of years ago. And it is uh, Greek mythology. It is make-believe. It is fairy tale. It is myth. Uh, it is not true. But there is one story that I wanted to bring out this morning to talk about, and I'm not a, I'm not a, a big um, geek or nerd on, on this subject. I've got others that I'm a geek and nerd on, but not this one. But the story is about the sirens. If you're familiar with Greek mythology, the sirens are those bird women, half bird, half women, um, that live on the island. And what they do is their beautiful singing is so alluring and so captivating that as the boats come by the, the, the rocks, the, 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 the sailors gravitate toward the island, the rocks destroy the ships, and then these bird women, I guess that's not a respectful, anyway, these sirens, they, they devour the flesh of the sailors who are destroyed on the island, all because of their singing. Well, there are two individuals in Greek mythology, and I'm not preaching this is true, this is make-believe, it's a fairy tale, I just want you to hear the, the moral of it, that's all. There are two figures that I wanted to point out this morning in the story of the sirens of these ladies, these bird women. They, uh, the first one is Ulysses. And Ulysses was, uh, was on his way through, and he wanted to get past the island, but he really wanted to hear the sound of the sirens. And so what he did is because he knew that it was going to be dangerous, he knew that no one had survived going through there, is what he did is he had his sailors put wax in their ears, so they couldn't hear anything, and then tie him to the mast of the ship so that as they went by, he could still hear the sirens, but the sailors could not. So they would not go into the rocks. They would not be destroyed. And I think somewhere along the way, he thought that maybe if he did that and he survived, then they wouldn't be able to do that anymore. Whole other story. 
But anyway, the point is, as he is sailing by, tied to the mast, he tells his sailors, do not let me go no matter what I do, no matter what gestures, nothing. Do not let me go. Don't untie me. And that's what they do. They ignore their captain, and they keep sailing by the, the sirens. The sirens make the music, but he hangs on because he is tied to the boat, and he can't do anything about it. Well, that's one example, but then there's someone else that I want you to, to hear about. That's, that's why I'm bringing this up. His name is Orpheus. Orpheus was son of Apollo, blah, 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 but the point is is he was the best musician ever lived. His music was so perfect, it was so beautiful that they would say that he had, better, he had better sound and better majesty than any other music on earth. And Jason, the Argonaut, um, there's movies and all that, anyway, he, he gets Orpheus and he says, I want you to go with me because I've got to pass the island with the sirens. I want you to go with me, but what I want you to do is when we get close enough to hear the sirens, I want you to play your music. So this is what happened. As they're passing by the rocks, the sirens start singing their magical tunes, but Orpheus plays even better music. And because of that, the sailors are not captivated by the sirens, they're captivated by Orpheus. Now, before you dismiss me because I brought in Greek mythology at a sermon time, listen to this, okay? All right, here we go. When we are tempted, when we have issues that draw us away from a loving God, we have two options. You can either be Ulysses and you can say, tie me up. Uh, get, get the soldiers with wax, wax in their ears. I'm going to grin and bear it. I'm going to do the best I can through this turmoil. Or, or you can come to the source of all good music and you can let Jesus be more than enough for you. You see, when we come to passages like Colossians chapter 1, I am overwhelmed by the fact that many times we minimize or diminish who God truly is so that when we are faced with temptation, we think, well, I've got to grin and bear it. I need to get some of my buddies to tie me to the boat so that I don't fall into temptation. That's not the point. The point is that the grace of God got you to where you are and the grace of God is going to keep you going. And unless we have the God-given wisdom to confess of our sins, to trust in who he is and what he's doing and give him to get, allow him to create in us a hunger for him so that we want to listen to him more than anything else. That's where this is going. So come back to Colossians chapter one. And I know that we cheated because you didn't get to see it on the screen. So I'm gonna ask you to do something really, really ra radical here this morning. I'm sorry in advance. I'm sorry if this ruins your day, but could you read it in the actual script in front of you or on your own Bibles? I'm sorry, but let's try it just this one time. A little bit of sarcasm, I apologize in advance. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. The very first part, if you're following along in the notes, another disadvantage of not having the PowerPoint, the very first point is that Jesus is Lord of all creation. Jesus is Lord of all creation. And I want to take you to Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of all creation. Now, to, to hear this, to see what he is saying, I'm going to pause there. I'm not done, but I'm going to pause there. Hear, hear what he's talking about. Firstborn, by the way, is a word that's often misunderstood. There's two different ways that it's used in the Scripture. It can be either by chronology, time, like you have six kids, and the first kid who was born is the firstborn. But the way it is used in this context, in this language, is not the firstborn by chronology, it's the firstborn by priority. For example, God called Israel and while they were coming out of captivity. He said, this, this nation is my firstborn. Israel was not the firstborn in time, they were first in priority. And when we understand that, when we see what he is doing, he's putting, he is putting himself at the very beginning of creation, before creation. Uh, David, he was considered the firstborn. He was the runt of the litter. He was the youngest of the brothers, but he was considered the firstborn. And David was going to have an heir that was going to come after him who was going to be the firstborn king. Now, how does that work? Because firstborn in this context is that the king that would come from David would be above David, highest priority, highest rank. So get that kind of understanding as you come to this passage and see what he's saying. Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God, which is 
boggles the mind, but then you keep going. He's the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So you get a sense of what he's doing here. See, what's happening in the church in Colossae, Paul had never been there. He hadn't met these Christians at all, but he had heard of their faith. He was praying that they would grow in their relationship with God. And in the midst of it, he hears that there are some false teachers who are coming in the midst of the church. And as they get in there, they say, you know, Jesus, good guy, really love him. He, he had a lot of good things to say, appreciate his teaching, really good moral. Everything is great about Jesus. I think he's great. But uh, have you tried so-and-so? He's good too. And have, have you looked over? And this is pretty good too. So what they would do is they would diminish who Jesus is. They would say, yeah, yeah, he was, he was human, but fully God, maybe. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, he could have been God, but was he completely human? Eh, maybe. And what they would do is they would plant these seeds of doubt into who Jesus Christ is. So Paul writes this letter, and he says, I'm going to set the record straight. You know, all of these powers, these spiritual authorities, all these things that you're saying, saying are equal to or even greater than Jesus, he made them. Everything that you're concerned about, about, well, should I follow this or should I do this or should I be about this? Jesus is greater than that because he's God. Because from him, by him, through him, to him are all things. So there is absolutely nothing on this earth, seen, unseen, created, spiritual, material, human, nothing that is greater than Jesus. Now think about what this means. When you're tempted to say, yes, if I, could just, if I could just have Jesus and, if I could just get this part of my life figured out, and then I'll use Jesus as well because I'm grateful, what are you doing? I was listening to a sermon this last week, and he talked about, imagine that Bill Gates gave you billions of his dollars, and you said, yes, I'm so grateful for these billions of dollars, but I'm really fond of this bell. And if you don't mind, I'll take your money, but I really don't want to leave without this bell. This is a cheap bell. I mean, it's not cheap, cheap. It's, I mean, it's a nice bell. I don't, I don't mean, sorry, but it, it's not the best bell in the world. And with all that money, you can buy plenty of bells. But what we do is we get the greatest treasure known to man. And we say, yes, Jesus, I want all of you. Oh, and I still want this too. And, and I still want that over there. I still want this person or this relationship or this situation or this job or this priority or this premise or this promise or this position or this popularity. I'm going to alliterate the P's till I, anyway, moving on, you, you get all these things that you want and you say, Jesus, you must not be enough. Come back to the passage and let me show you how this works. All things were created by him. That's the next blank. First blank was all creation. The next blank is by him. And for a cheap cup of Coke, I will give you all the blanks later if you don't get them this morning. All things were created by him. That means everything. All things. You notice in verse 17, he is before all things. That means he is not created. That means he is fully God. But in the midst of that, it also means that before creation, he is. That's why, that's why numerous times in the Gospel of John, he says, I am. They, they laugh at him. How did you know Abraham? Abraham died hundreds of years ago. And he said, well, before Abraham, I am. When we understand who Jesus is and everything was created by him, then we see that only Jesus perceived creation. That's the next blank. See, he's the source. He's the beginning. He is not just the firstborn of creation. He is the source of creation. And because he had it in his mind to create us, everything, seen and unseen, heaven and earth, visible, invisible, thrones, dominions, rulers, authorities, everything comes from him. There is absolutely nothing that is beyond or above or outside of who Jesus is. Now, this is why we need this. You see, when you're in the midst of temptation, when you're struggling on a day-to-day -day basis, when you're perhaps isolated and by yourself, we need the body of Christ to come back together and remember the one we worship is not just a religious fantasy. He's not a fairy tale. He's the one who made you. And the fact that you are sitting here this morning, the fact that you're listening, the fact that you can hear with ears, see with eyes, that you can breathe, that you can think, 
is because someone made you, and that someone is Jesus. What amazes me is how the Trinity works in two primary ways through Scripture. The first is in creation. You'll see it with the Spirit of God hovering over creation, the, the God the Father as He is as dictating it, God the Son as He is, is put, bringing it to fruition. And then in recreation, salvation, the same is true. Jesus is God the Son who brings about that salvation because God the Father, for God so loved the world, He sent His Son. And God the Spirit brings that redemption to completion as our guarantee, as our inheritance. All of that working within the Trinity, the one God, three persons, each fully, equally, and eternally divine. All this happens because of who Jesus is. All things were created by him. All things were created through him. This is the next blank. B, all things were created through him. Because of who he is, because of what he has done, nothing is outside of his power, out of his authority. He is the agent. He is the power. As a matter of fact, he is the God. He is God. And the ability for us to continue, to even be here, to maintain, to sustain, is by His grace. He holds all things together. So the next time someone comes to you and says that we were, were descended from apes, that we have some sort of big bang or, big bang or evolution or some sort of weird theory of, of, of atheism or of not understanding God, understand that according to Colossians chapter 1, if Jesus Christ did not begin and not, did not maintain who you are, you would not be breathing here right now. You would not be. You would not exist. Nothing would exist. He doesn't just create. He continues. He is the agent of creation, which means that he holds all things together. This Jesus Christ, whom we, we proclaim, who is Lord, who is Savior, is also the one and only God. And there is nothing that is outside of him and who he is and what he does. That means that he holds you together. Whether you acknowledge it or not, you admit it or not, you want to, want to be relevant to you or not, it doesn't matter. He still is who he says he is. Every knee will bow. Every knee will call him Lord. The only issue is whether or not you and I will have the God-given sense to give him the, the recognition, the gratefulness, the thanksgiving for who he truly is that we cannot be without him. That means that he holds your life in his hand. Do you hear that? Everything. The stresses you have, the anxieties you have, the pressures you have, the family, the job, the situations, the virus, the racism, the riots, everything is beneath Jesus. Nothing is beyond him. Your life is in his hands. Your calling is in his hands. Your being is in his hands. Why on earth, why on earth would we deny him? But even more importantly, why would we dethrone him? Why would we treat him, use his name in vain? Why would we dismiss him? Why would we minimize him when he is who the scripture says he is? John chapter 1. There's many verses in this first chapter of John, but let me just share a few. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Only Jesus produced creation. He holds it all together. Verse 17 of Colossians chapter 1. He holds all of it together. Did you see how he said that? He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He keeps it together. He does that. Why is the earth where it is in relation to the sun? Because Jesus keeps us where we belong. This is why we exist. Why would we give him anything less than everything? The one other part in verse 16 I want to point out. All things were created by him. All things were created through him. All things were created for him. He's the goal. Only Jesus is the goal of creation. So only Jesus perceived creation, only Jesus produced creation, and only Jesus is the goal of creation. 
The false teachers would try to get you to think that you're here to live for yourself, that you're, you just want to be healthy, wealthy, and wise, that it's all about you and what you can get out of this temporary life. And Jesus is not just the creator. He is not just the sustainer. It is all for his glory. We're here for him. We're here to lift him up. We're here to make much of his name. We're here to be about him. Everything is about him. All right, so when we see that, when we, we live in that creation, it changes how we live. It changes what we think. It changes how we respond. Because now all of a sudden, it isn't about you and I being the center of the universe. We see who truly is and deserves that one and only firstborn of creation. But he's not done. This is enough, but he's not done. He's going to keep going in Colossians chapter 1. And he's going to talk just not about the creation. He's also going to talk about salvation in the church. And he begins in verse 18. He does something pretty radical. He says, Jesus is Lord not just of all creation. Jesus is also Lord of the new creation, meaning the church, the body of Christ, his bride. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 18, it says, He is the head of the body, the church. He is the head of the body, the church. Because of his authority, because of who he is, he's in charge. He's the one who leads us. He's the one who dictates. He's the one who guides. He is our greatest portion. He is our greatest need. He is our greatest fulfillment. The church was created by him. Let me give you a hint. You're taking notes. I know this isn't everyone, but when I was in school, I would get more upset about missing a blank on the notes than I would about anything else. I don't even care what the subject was. I've got to get the notes right. It's going to be by, through, and for on both sections. So the church was created by, B-Y, him. The church was created by him. It means that he created it, he organized it, he brought it into existence. He is the head, he is the body, he is, he is the head of the body, he is the leader, he is the ruler. He is the way that it, it, it is sustained, and Jesus, only Jesus, leads the church. Only Jesus is in charge. He is the head of the body of the church. I love the way people come up to me and say, because I'm the preacher, this is my church. No. He is the head of the body, the church. I love the way, and I'm being a little bit sarcastic, people think that I'm actually in charge. I'm not in charge. I'm accountable to the one who is in charge. So the decisions I make, you may think I'm making them with you, but I'm praying and asking, boss, what do I do here? Because I'm not in charge, and you're not either. You see, part of, part of what we understand as believers in Christ is that because he is the head of the church, that we do what he tells us to do. And one of the most grievous, worst things that we could ever do is go off the rails and just do what we want to do because we think it's a good idea. Come back to this. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. The church was created by him. Only Jesus leads the church. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Did you catch that? Because of your relationship with Jesus Christ, you become a part of the body of Christ. Because of that, our responsibility, our, our, our goal, our privilege is to grow up. And as we speak the truth in love, verse 15, we grow up in every way into him, into Christ. We become more like him, conformed in his image. And then it says in verse 16, in Ephesians chapter 4, whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. I want to give you a little bit of, uh, this is a little bit of parentheses, but you can't see the clock from where you're sitting, so it'll be okay. Just give me just a second, okay? When you debate whether or not to be a part of the body of Christ, it isn't about personal preference. It's about Ephesians chapter 4. If you debate whether or not you're going to be used in the service of his, his kingdom and you're going to use your spiritual gifts to be a part of his kingdom growing, if you do not do that, if you submit to the bedroom um, Baptist or the, the pillow and the sister sheets and you want to be in your church in your own bedroom on a Sunday morning, you're missing out on what Ephesians 4 is talking about. It's saying that if you aren't plugged in as God created you to be plugged in, you are causing a disease, a dis-ease in the body. You are causing an unhealthy relationship with the body of Christ so that we don't grow up 
into the head as he's called us and commanded us to grow. This isn't just about you. And if you and I are not participating as he's created and called us to participate, then we're hurting his body and we can't grow. See, calls for church membership, calls for participation, calls for service, calls for tithes, calls for offerings. It's just money. This is just a building. What matters is growing up in Jesus. And if you're missing that, you're losing. You're, you're, you're in the boat. You're going by the sirens. And maybe your buddies have tied you to the mast and they can't hear a thing. You're going to grit, grit your teeth. You're going to grin and bear it. You're going to do the best you can. But you're going to miss out on the best music ever. The church was created by him. The church was also created through him. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, verse 18. We continue in the verses, and he says, He is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning. There's another firstborn, the firstborn from the dead. Not just the firstborn, first priority, highest rank among creation. He is also the firstborn from the dead. That in everything he might be preeminent. You see, he gets the top billing. He gets priority. He gets firstborn, first, first rank, first status in everything. Not just in creation, but also in the conquering death. The church was created through him. Meaning that Jesus Christ is our great redeemer. He is our creator. He did everything for us. And then when we broke, he didn't break, we broke. When we broke, he came to us so that he could create the church and it would be maintained by him. Upon this rock, I will build my church. Because of what we do in connection with him as his body, he is able to grow us up. But I want to show you what's happening. The way that this, this works is Jesus Christ coming incarnate in the flesh, fully God, fully human. But it wasn't enough that he came to this earth, that he, he set aside, he never released, he set aside his divinity, Philippians chapter 2. When he came to this earth, as he walked among us, he lived the perfect life without sin, total obedience, trust, faith in God the Father, reliant upon God the Spirit. As all of this is happening, he's walking on this earth, it's not enough it's important, it's vital, but it's not enough that he came. It's not enough that he lived perfectly. It's not even enough that he died for your sins. He had to do one other thing. He had to rise again. It wasn't enough that he paid the penalty. He also provided the victory. It wasn't enough that he died in your place. He lives in your place as well. It isn't enough that he sacrificed himself as the Passover lamb. He had to die, but he had to rise again. Because the last enemy, more than Satan, more than any kind of evil, is death. And until Jesus, fully God, fully human, put his foot on the throat of death, there was still something that was powerful. But now, now, the firstborn of the dead, now there is absolutely nothing beyond or greater than Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, because of that, we can go to, a fee, to Romans chapter 8 and we can say nothing will separate us from the love of Christ. Nothing. Because there now is nothing created, uncreated, visible, invisible. Nothing that is bigger than him, greater than him. The church was created through him. Only Jesus conquered death. The parallels here between what Jesus did as the second or the last Adam compared to what the first Adam did back in Genesis. Well, let me show you. Shane, well, actually, I'm going to tell you, and you're not going to see a thing, but here, here it is. Shane Morris wrote about this years ago. He said, the first Adam, the first Adam yielded to temptation in the garden. The last Adam beat temptation in a garden. The first Adam ate, and a covenant was broken. The last Adam ate, and a covenant was established. The first Adam was a man who sought to become like God. The last Adam was God who became a man. The first Adam was naked and received clothes. The last Adam had clothes, clothes but was stripped naked. The first Adam tasted death from a tree. The last Adam tasted death on a tree. The first Adam hid from the face of God. The last Adam begged God not to hide his face. The first Adam blamed his bride. The last Adam took the blame for his bride. The first Adam brought thorns and thistles. The last Adam wore thorns and thistles. The first Adam gained a wife when God opened man's side. The last Adam gained a wife when man opened God's side. The first Adam brought a curse 
the last Adam became a curse. The first Adam was made immortal and chose to die. The last Adam was made mortal and chose to rise. The first Adam listened when the serpent said, take and eat. The last Adam told his followers, take and eat. The church was created by him, through him, and for him. The church was created for him. Colossians chapter 1, verse 19. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. In him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. When we understand that phrase, Solomon built the temple. There was the tabernacle, then the temple. And even as he was building it, he was praying to God and saying, who are we to create a structure because you are greater, no building, God saying, no building, no tabernacle, nothing in all of earth can hold me, in all of heaven can hold me. There is nothing because God is spirit and truth, nothing physical that will limit who God is. He, he is beyond time, space, matter. But here in Colossians chapter 1, verse 19, don't read over it too quickly. For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. John 1 talks about him coming in the flesh, tabernacling among us. The same word for when the tents were in the Old Testament. If we lose sight of the fact that even a physical building couldn't contain God, yet Jesus, when he walked on this earth, the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in him, that should overwhelm us. Because he was fully God and fully human, he alone had the privilege, the honor of being all of that, as he walked on this earth. Then verse 20, through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Only Jesus reconciles all things. Do you see it? Only Jesus reconciles all things. That's the last blank. Congratulations if you got them. I'll get with you later if you didn't. Only Jesus reconciles all things. That means, whether it be spiritual, whether it be material, whether it be human, whether it be seen, whether it be unseen, regardless of what is happening in your world, regardless of what you think you know, what you know, or what you want to know, the only things, the only things that are greater than Jesus is nothing. And because of that, he reconciles everything to him. When the fall came, everything was tainted by sin. Everything was destroyed. And because of that destruction, because it hit the, the human creation, because it hit human, the, the created world, because it hit the material world and the immaterial world, the visible and the invisible, the dominion, the authorities, the powers, because sin went through and pervaded everything like a cancer, Jesus Christ in his grace came and said every area that has been marked by sin, every area that has been touched by sin, I'm greater than that. And my grace has gotten bigger and greater than anything else. That's why we come to him. That's why we seek his face. Now I want to come back now to those last few verses. Colossians chapter, 20, chapter 1, verse 21, 22, 23. These are the verses that come from our question. Our question and answer. Are you ready for the question? And these are the ones that we've dealt with. And I want to, I want to focus on these for just the, the remaining few minutes this morning. Colossians chapter 1, verse 21. And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Then verse 23. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. There have been a couple of cults in our world that have started from Colossians chapter 1 because they have looked at these, these verses, and instead of studying the language and the context, they've taken them out of context, and now they walk around and say things like, Jesus is not fully God, that you can lose your salvation. I want you to see what these verses are saying because they're very important. In verse 23, let's start there. 
When he says, if indeed you continue, he is not saying that you may not continue. It is the same word we would use since. He is saying because God has brought you to this point, you will continue in the faith. You will be stable, stable and steadfast. You will not shift from the hope of the gospel that you've heard. Because of what we have in Jesus and how he is the firstborn of creation as well as the dead, we have no fear, we have no worries because of what he has done for us. But now let's look, please, in verse 21 and 22 and get a sense of what he has done for you. In verse 21, you once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. Did you see it? Not just that your thinking was perverted, it was distorted. You were alienated, you were hostile. You didn't just disagree, you were angry about it and doing evil deeds. So it wasn't just what you thought, it's what you did. More than that, these are people who were outside of the Old Covenant, so they didn't even have the Old Testament to rely upon. They had no hope without Jesus. Then in verse 22, he says he's now reconciled in his body of flesh. That's why he has to be fully God and fully human. He is reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. To present you holy, blameless, above reproach before him. If Jesus Christ, if you diminish him to such a point where he becomes an escape hatch, if he becomes a a safety net, If he becomes someone that you'll trust in so that when you die, you won't go to hell, you've missed it completely. He did not bring you back. He did not reconcile you to himself so that you could just get along and get along. He didn't didn't do it so you wouldn't rock the boat. He didn't do it so that you would feel better about yourself. He brought you back, verse 22, so that you would be holy, blameless, and above reproach before him. He did not create you and then recreate you so that you could go back to the way you were before. He did not make you new, a new creation, so that you could act like you used to act. You were alienated, you are no more. You were separated, you are no more. Now you're with him. And because of that, because of that, he comes in and he says, I've got you in this. I've got what you need. I am more than your portion. I am your good shepherd. I will guide you. I will lead you. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Because of who he is, he is our greatest portion. He is our greatest satisfaction. And when we say it's Jesus plus, fill in the blank, we're missing who Jesus really is. He brought us in to make us holy, to be attributed the righteousness that comes from him. He brought us in to make us blameless so that when we stand before him on that final day, we will be guilty, but guilty no more because he took the guilt upon himself and we will be innocent in his presence. He did all of this for you and for me so that we could know him. So let's come back. Let's come back to what we're talking about. That silly little story from hundreds of years ago. If you are like Ulysses, And you think that all you have to do when you are struggling with sin, all you have to do is just grin and bear it. Get some of your buddies to tie you up to the boat so you don't drift. Go isolate yourself. Go get out of the way. Just go be a hermit somewhere. You've missed it. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't deny ourselves. I'm not saying we shouldn't have serious um, issues of, of amputation when our eye causes us to sin, when our our hand or our foot causes us to sin. What I'm saying is, if you leave your walk with Christ with a help me just make it through the night, you've missed it. Because what he does for you is he, just like Orpheus, he comes in and says, do you see that you have this great temptation? You have this great desire? You have this great distraction? And that I'm not gonna just give you what you need to get through it, grin and bear it, grit your teeth. I want you to be so passionate about me that I will be the greatest music you've ever heard. And when you reflect upon my music, when you reflect upon my sound, when you reflect upon my grace, you will see that it's not about you just muddling through, it's about me. And when you let yourself be captivated by Jesus, Everything else becomes so pale, so petty, so trivial. And those things that you, you were tempted, you were, you were lured, but look at him. You, you thought, wow, that would, but look at him. And as you, as you see him for who he truly is, he becomes greater and greater and greater. So all of a sudden, it's not about your glory, it's about his. It's not about your success, it's about his. It's not about your name, it's about his name. And when he gets lifted up, and when you draw yourself 
to him. Then all of a sudden, you're captivated. And those, those powers, those authorities, those chains, they fall down. Within the question and answer, and I won't, I, I won't take the time to read it. You've got it on the bottom of your, your bulletin. But within the question and answer, he uses two very important words that I want to finish with. See, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he took care of the penalty of sin. Penalty. He took care of every debt you would ever owe if you trust in him. This is the gospel. But it doesn't stop there. You see, as we abide in him, as he forgives us of our sin, as we become these new creatures in him, what he did on the cross in the past took care of the penalty. What we have in him now as we abide in him is he takes care of the power of sin in our life. You see, according to Romans chapter 6, chapter 7, chapter 8, as we, according to the book of Romans, actually the whole thing, we no longer are slaves to sin. We're no longer captive to the things that before would lure us into the rocks and we would be eaten by the bird women. That's not us anymore. That, that's not where we belong. Because of what he has done for us, the penalty was paid for and the power is diminished. It's conquered. And because of that, it doesn't mean that you can live a perfect life on this earth. That's glory. What it means is his grace is more than enough. There is not one thing on this earth that he cannot and will not take care of. I've been asked this last week, and I'm grateful to be online. Um, I've been asked this last week, how do we respond to everything happening? Yes, the COVID, but what about the racism? What about the riots? What about the police and all the things that are happening in the culture? And even as I thought about that, I thought no matter what I say, it's going to be polarizing. And there are going to be people who will disagree with me, people who will be adamant, may even have people turn off the television or get up and leave the sanctuary. But let me tell you what I know. And I've been praying, I don't have all the answers, but this I know. Jesus is the firstborn of creation. And there is nothing greater than Jesus. He is not just the creator of man. He is also the solution to the problems of man. And until we have the God-given wisdom to submit to his lordship, not a movement, not a theory, not a doctrine or dogma, but until we have the God-given wisdom to submit to his authority, his su sufficiency, his supremacy, his preeminence, there's not a thing in the world man's going to do to fix a broken man. We cannot be okay without Jesus. The gospel has been the answer. The gospel will be the answer. There is no other way. Now, I mean no offense to those who have experienced pain. As a matter of fact, I think it would help us as a church to pray about empathy and sympathy a lot more than judgment and condescending attitudes. But in the sense of this, only Jesus is the answer. See, okay, I mentioned just a second ago, let me finish with this. The penalty, the power, there will be a day when the presence of sin will be gone. Where there will be no pain, there will be no tears, there will be no injustice, there will be no racism, there will be no wrong, evil. That will be the day where we will be presented before our Savior, not because of how perfect we are, but because of how perfect he is. Not because we have achieved it, but because he achieved it. Not because of what we have done, but because of what he did and is doing and will do. And when we get to that point, when we bow our knee and we confess with our tongue, Jesus is Lord, voluntarily, involuntarily, everybody's going to do it. That will be the day we'll see that he was and is and always will be the answer. One of the greatest fears is that we are going to not just deny Jesus, but dethrone him. Not allow him to be the king that he is, and he rightly deserves to be. That means every day, denying ourselves, taking up our cross, following him. It means every day, needing him, dependent upon him, abiding in him. 
It means every day, every day seeking his face. It means that when you encounter sin, instead of tying yourself to the boat like Ulysses, you confess that you are a sinner in need of a savior. You confess that you are not okay without his help. And then you affirm the fact that his grace is more than enough. And you ask him not just to save you from this temptation, not just to keep you so that you will be more like him, but that you would change, he would change you more like him. You see, we often leave it at the guilt. We often leave it at the shame. We often stay um, in the boat and we say, well, we made it through and we're going to be okay because we survived that temptation. That's not what Jesus wants. He wants, to, he wants to change your wanter. He wants to change your heart. He wants to make you more like him. And part of that is that holiness and that blamelessness, that without reproach. And sometimes when we come face to face with the temptations and the spiritual warfare and the struggles that we are experiencing this very moment, the temptation is, Lord, just get me through the next few hours, get me the next few days, and I'm going to be fine. Stop it. Because what happens next week when you face the same temptation and you have the same weakness and the same need? What he does is more than that. He comes in and he says in John, 1 John chapter 1, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to cleanse us, but also to purify us. Not just to take care of the guilt, take care of the penalty, but to come in and diminish the power so that we no longer fall. It means that those who walk with Christ still sin, but they sin less. It means that those who walk with Christ are no longer struggling with the same intensity that they did 5 or 10 or 15 years ago because God is changing us, sanctifying us, moving us. If there is no growth in the last few weeks, months, years of your walk with Christ, you're stymied. You're stunt. You need help. And let me tell you where you can get it. As the musicians come forward, we're going to come into a time of invitation. As we do this, I'm going to ask if you'd bow your heads with me, whether you be here in the sanctuary or, or at home, this is the time where you get to encounter your Lord. You get to talk to the firstborn of creation and the firstborn of the dead. The Lord of creation, the Lord of the new creation. You get to be in his presence. Every head bowed, every eye closed. The invitation is simple. Come for the first time or come and let him renew you. Lord Jesus, thank you for who you are. I pray that you would give us insight so that we never approach you shallow or trite or presumptuous. May we see you for who you are. May we believe. And then may you, by your grace, take our hearts, our minds, change us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me, please? God.
seated for just a moment, please. We've got a couple of great families that are going to come forward. Just go ahead and bring them up, Joel. <laughs> I'm going to let you introduce the kids. Oh, okay. All right, so this is, this is Mike Coburn and Tish and uh, Kirsten. And um, they've come forward to, uh, to want to join the church. So, um, and then, do you want me to do both of them? Yeah, you got the okay. Cards right there, right? All right. <laughs> and then, uh, this is Mike and Joyce King, who have also come forward to, uh, to join the church today. So, how are we going to do this? Okay, we've got to find out, is it, is, it, is it by statement or by letter? By letter. By statement for, for Mike and Tish, and by letter for... Uh, Joyce and Mike. <laughs> and where's the letter from? The refuge in Bushnell. The refu- the refuge in Bushnell. Okay. So, so you know, the way that this works is um, when you join the church, you're coming by statement, meaning that you, don't, you hadn't belonged to a, a church of like faith and, and order before, so you're coming professing Christ and saying you've been baptized and you want to be a part of our fellowship. If you belong to a church that's similar in our beliefs, um, you have been baptized in that church, then you come by letter. So it's either by statement or by letter. So that's so we got both here. Now here's the problem. How we usually what happens is we let them stay up here, and you come through and you shake their hand and give them hugs and say welcome to the body and and welcome to the church. How are we going to do that? You guys got any ideas? Elbow bumps. Elbow bumps? Okay, we can wave. We do that. All right. How about how about this? How about after we stand and pray and dismiss? How about you come and stay within six feet or three feet or however close you want to, and just say hey, hey to them, wave at a close proximity or shake their hand or whatever. And if they get offended by that, then I'll bring them some sanitizer and they can work on that later. All right, all right. So if you are if you are a member of First Baptist, and and I take this what I'm about to do seriously because um, it really is. If you are a member of First Baptist and you are willing to bring these these precious families into our our fellowship, hold them accountable, pray for them, love on them, allow them to do the same for you, would you please say amen? Amen. Amen. All right, well, welcome. There you go. That's good. All right, so I'm going to let them, I'm going to let them stay up here and you do whatever you want to do, um, but I'm, I'm grateful. Let's uh, stand and we're going to dismiss some prayers. Anybody up there have a microphone? Actually, where did Joe go? Yeah, he's right here. Right, Joe. Yeah, there you go. Say something in about five seconds when we start walking. Okay. Five, four, three, two. <laughs> All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for um, who you are. We thank you for today. We thank you for the message. And uh, Lord, we thank you for these, uh, these families that have uh, responded to, to your call to become members of this, um, this congregation. Um, Lord, may we um, um, hold them accountable and, um, and, and build them up and all focused on you and you alone. Um, Lord, please guard our hearts, guard our minds, help us to see you and help us to hear your voice this week as we go out. We pray all these things in Jesus' name, amen.